Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Well, this is the hardest part of it all, you know, to be able to say, well, this is the last meeting. But uh, I, I'm not going to say that because I'm going to get him back here. Amen? Uh, he's worth once a month. So anyway, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, I, I just want to say this about uh, you guys. This one thing, one thing. When I, I began to listen to Steve. You know, it just for me, it's like a, it's like ABCs. You know, because it's something that's ingrained in my heart. And sister friend said the other day, um, she was talking about some situations, people. One thing I I, I have to make clear. The guy's an instructor, he's a teacher, and every time I listen to him, that's the way he goes about it. And he digs into the, the aspects of the scriptures. And I said to him, when he started talking about Abraham, I said to him, you know, all this is is a picture of redemption. And if, if you really understood the scriptures, it's over and over and over again. We try to make it a historical thing, which it is, but it, behind the scenes, God is just constantly showing you his picture of purpose and redemption. Purpose and redemption. Purpose and redemption. And that's it. Now, without purpose, there's no need for redemption. Okay? But because God had purpose, then there's need for redemption. Okay? And I think redemption is more than just getting you from something bad to something good. Adam needed redemption. He needed redemption in, his, in the fact that God met with him daily. He was redeeming him not from something, but to something, to the purpose, to the fulfillment of whatever God wants. And God's people got to wake up and begin to realize that it's a greater effort to take you to where you're going than it is to get you from where you've been. Amen. Because Calvary took care of where you were. But the ongoing process of the Holy Ghost in our life is to take us to where God has destined us to go. And it's more than just dying and going to heaven. Because Jesus, he, Steve quoted it the other night, Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Revelation tells us Jerusalem is coming down, not going up. So we have to wake up, beloved, and begin to realize what God wants to do. He wants to do it here on planet Earth. He wants to develop it here on planet Earth. Wherever it goes from there, God's got a plan. He hadn't revealed that part to me. And he doesn't need to because it's his job. But I know that it says all creation. That's stars, that's uncreated places, that's all creation is in travail. In other words, it's looking for something. It's looking for something. It's looking for God's sons to begin to manifest God on the planet. Amen? That's what it is. How are they going to see Jesus in you? How are they going to see him in me? The world has been looking for Jesus to come, but it was just like the world that then was. Guess what? He showed up, and they didn't know him. The Bible says he came to his own, and his own received him not. Why? Because he didn't come within their mindset. And this is the issue. It's got to begin with us, the church, beloved. It's got to begin with us. We got to begin to realize that God's got purpose. And it's got to start in the church. You're not going to fix the world around you till you get fixed. And God wants to fix it here first. Praise God. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to preach. Amen. Come on, man of God. Come on. Come on. Amen. God has a plan. That plan is working. It's inclusive of every other we walk with him. We see it unfold and we understand the unfolding in a much greater way. Well, good morning to everyone. How are you today? 
You ready to see the Patriots lose to a team from the South? <laughs> I thought I'd get a response out of you from there. I guess I'm the only one in here from the South. Anybody else from the South? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. So I guess I'm the only one that's got to focus my faith today because the rest of you, you know, you're pooled together, so you really don't have to focus. All you have to do is just rejoice and enjoy it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, nah, quite frankly, I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't care who wins. <laughs> I have so enjoyed my time uh, being here with you this weekend. Thanks, Dale and Fran, for inviting me always. You're, you're in my heart. You know we're joined together. Amen. And because they're in my heart, you're in my heart as well. And we pray for you. Um, believe in God that what he has begun here, he's going to perfect. Yes. He's going to bring it to full fruition and completion. I believe that with all of my heart. That's the reason that, part of the reason that I continue to do what I do uh, is because I know that God cannot fail and he will accomplish. Amen. We will see fruit that remains. Yes. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. We're not just uh, laboring in vain here. We're not running in vain. This, this thing is really working. And so I'm grateful for, for what he's doing. Um, I would just ask you to continue to keep us in prayer. Um, uh, I think this year is probably going to bring about some pretty important decisions in my life um, as I move along in uh, progress in this new season uh, that I'm in. And uh, it's not one that I'm weary about. It's not one that I'm sad about. Uh, you, you move on. Uh, you realize that your life is in God's hands just as every person's life who's in him is in his hands. And you move forward. There comes a point uh, last year, uh, as I uh, reminded myself, Dale, of the scripture, I said, you know, when Moses, God's servant, died, God gave them one month to mourn their dead. And then he said, now, Joshua, you and all of his people, get up, you rise up, you cross this Jordan, you've got to move forward. Because you see, if you remain in a place of mourning too long, you certainly will impede your progress. And secondly, you will stunt your growth. And so you have to make a decision intentionally that you're going to rise up from that place and you're going to move forward. Initially, it was a little bit of a struggle for me. Uh, sometimes I, I preached and I wept the whole time I'm preaching. Uh, but nevertheless, as I continued to get up, the weeping turned. And what was a valley of Baca turned into a pool of rejoicing. I know it works. I live through it. You see, when you're talking theory, that's one thing. But when you're talking the experience of your life, that's another thing. And I decided, I made the decision. You see, when you say, I will rejoice, that's the decision that you make. God didn't make that one for you. Now, he provides you the grace to do it. But you have to make the decision to do it. My, uh, my daughter recently said to me, uh, she said, uh, her daddy said, uh, aren't we still uh, mourning Ma's death? I said, no. I said, now, I know that you have to process it the way that you have to process it. I said, but no, dad's not mourning. She said, what? I said, you have to understand, sweetheart. I said, uh, your mother's rejoicing. Why should I be back here crying? Now, I don't mean to sound callous or anything or insensitive, 
I'm just telling you the way it really should work with a son of God. I said she's no longer in a body which doesn't work anymore. And God in his mercy gave her a release from that. I said uh, we honored her. We were very grateful. Dale and Fran, they came to help us in doing that. They celebrated her life. I said, so why should I spend whatever psychology says? What is it, two, three years, and then you're able to, you know, tie your shoestrings and go for it? Tell your neighbor, that's nonsense. Yeah, that's nonsense. So this is what I did. When I got back home, Susan, who was Ann's, uh, I hope you don't mind me talking about this one more. Susan, Ann's, she was Ann's armor bearer for over 30 years. And Ann literally invested herself into Susan. And Susan said, Pastor, that's what she still calls me, although I'm not a pastor anymore. She said, uh, Miss Ann left me with certain uh, uh, responsibilities and uh, obligations toward you. I said, well, I'll, I'll just release you from some of them. I said, because I might want to make a decision, and you might be thinking, I don't need to make it. But anyway, when we got back home, you'll catch up with that about tomorrow. When we got back home, I said, Susan, gather all the clothes, gather all the shoes, let's box them all, and let's get them out of here. She said, Pastor, you sure? I said, absolutely, I'm sure. I said, this is Romans 7. If you keep the clothes around, hanging in the closet, the shoes there to look at, all you're going to remember is your misery. I said, you have to move from Romans 7 to Romans 8, where you began to live again. I said, and this is what we're going to do with the clothes. We're going to take them to a shelter where... They, they will uh, benefit women who have been in the sex trafficking trade. A lot of them are short, just like Anne was from the Central American countries. These are fine clothes because I only brought her, I only brought her the best. I said, so when they work back into uh, society and they go job hunting, they'll have something look decent in it. I said, we're going to make sure that what she left behind blesses somebody. I said, so let's gather them together. And I know that she would want that. I said, come on, hanging around the closet. What I, what I placed on her, you know, in that final viewing when she was in her coffin, that's all the clothes she'll ever need in this world. Somebody else. They're now benefiting from that. I'm blessed by that. That was step number one. Now, I took some other steps, too. And because of that, I'm telling you, there was a joy that came back into my heart. That is, for me, the only way that I can describe it is like the scripture says, is joy unspeakable and full of glory. And it's not full of sadness. Amen. So, so uh, I just want you to know that your, your brother is making good progress. And, and we're moving forward in the purpose of God. Amen. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Amen. Friday night I started out by talking about how that I had been in the book of Genesis with Abraham for the last three months. And, and just unearthing treasures from the scriptures uh, you know, when you walk with God um, nearly a half century, you've read the book of Genesis a whole lot of times if you read. Because God will bring you back to rehearse uh, things that you have read and over and over. And, and the scriptures never stop speaking. There's something new. There's something fresh. There's something that you weren't aware of all the time. And so that's why it's important to keep reading. And as I read, the Lord said, I want to talk to you, have a conversation with you about an aspect of what you probably will be proclaiming in this new season of your life, dealing with him. He said, now, 
the uh, long-range view of this is to help to reestablish the doctrine of the church. Now, of course, being people who are given to the word, you're students of the word, the man of God here is a student of the word, that I know. I didn't just meet him yesterday. We've known each other for over 30 years. So that I know. And you know that the Greek term that the word church is transliterated from is the word ecclesia, which simply means that you're called out with a purpose, and that purpose is to come back to the original mandate to rule. God placed man on the earth for the purpose of rule. And so anything, any instrument that he would use, any wineskin that he would use, would be moving back toward that particular original mandate. All right? So here we are. So the doctrine of the church, what exactly are we dealing with? I took you to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1 and 2, and talked about how that doctrine will come to us as rain. The Lord said, my doctrine will come as the rain. And then he began to talk about how that it will be distilled, simply meaning that he'll break it up, it'll come slowly, it will come progressively, and we'll understand it. I am finding today that for the generation that we call the millennials, we've got to be very proactive and intentional in teaching them the scripture. Now, they're good at gadgets, really good at gadgets. And in fact, I, whenever I, I need some help, I call my son or my daughter, and they say, Daddy, you'll just do this, 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 this. I says, wait, slow down, because Dad is a step-by-step, line-upon-line, precept-upon-precept person. So you got to slow down and tell, and tell me exactly what you just told me. And so, you know, they're good at gadgets, but as far as having really given themselves to learn the scripture. We've got to help them there. Now, I don't, I don't wear hair anymore because if I did, I would probably look like Mr. Hobo. Anybody ever say Mr. Hobo? You remember Mr. Hobo the clown? He had a great big bush on the, on the sides, but on the top he didn't have anything. And, and I choose not to look like that, so I just shave it all off. And, and uh, but, but, you know, for those of you who still do have hair, and uh, as the scripture would say, you have a hoary head, H-O-A-R-Y, not W-H-O-R-Y. You have a hoary head that is a white head. You're still here because there's a tremendous contribution that you can make. You can convey the things that you have learned, the lessons that God has taught you through life, and many of them through repetition. Because sometimes we don't catch all the nuances of the lesson at first. And so God will repeat the lesson. But we have a great, we have a great task before us. We have a great contribution to make. There was a young man from Nigeria, you know, I travel into Africa quite a bit. And a young man from Nigeria, he, he, he sent me a note one time. He said, it's time for you older guys, and I didn't appreciate being called an older guy. But he said, it's time for you older guys to sit down and let the new Joshua generation rise up and begin to move forward. I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, okay. I said, tell me how old you are. And he was something like 26 or 27. And, and what I really wanted to tell him was, I've forgotten more scripture than you've ever learned yet, but nevertheless, I didn't go there. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even go there. I said, uh, I said, okay, that's interesting. I said, do you know how old Joshua was? And he said, no. I said, do you know how old Caleb was? He said, no. I said, well, okay. Well, let this old man inform you. Since you're proclaiming that you are part of something and you don't even know how old they were when they started their assignment. I said, Joshua was 80 years old and Caleb was 85 years old. I said, now how old did you say you were? <laughs> and so then I shared with him my age and I said, that would make me closer to being a Joshua than you. He said, oh. <laughs> and I just shared with him. I said, just be careful with your words. 
you never know who you're talking to. And don't be regurgitating stuff you hear everybody else say without understanding. And so in spending my time back with Ephraim, it's interesting how he begins at age 75. Now, there's how many people in here over 75? Don't be ashamed of it. You should never be ashamed of your age. It's only a number. Well, it's a number with some mileage. <laughs> and the reason I know that, Dale and I went over to the Hall of Fame. And, I, and our last portion of our journey was to shoot some baskets. I was quickly reminded <laughs> that I wasn't 17 anymore. I started to push up to do a jump shot, and my knee said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> my first shot I took, and I said, oh, my God, I didn't even reach the basket. <laughs> what in the world is going on here? I was reminded of something. I'm not 17 anymore. At 17, it's any direction. Dunk it any direction with either hand, any direction you name. And now, I'm just trying to tell my leg, all right, you will cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit more than a number. It's a number with some mileage on it. But probably there's a few of you in here that's, that's 75. Isn't it interesting that God starts this man on his journey at that point? And then he gets to live the next 100 years on this journey. I will too. Because Genesis 12 tells us that Abram was 75 years old. And we know, according to Genesis 25, he was 175 years old when he died. So he is 100 years that the processings of God works in his life. Now there are those that convey this thought as well that the process is no longer valid because of the finished work. There are certain things that the finished work absolutely finished. It brought conclusion to. But here's the flip side of the coin. Have you allowed what is finished to be finished inside of you? And I submit to you that it will not finish without a process. Because God knows not a single one of us could take it all at once. That's why he said to Israel, I'm not going to give you the land all at once. Because if I did, he said, what you'll find out is that the beast will come upon you and literally devour you. Now, when you bring that into the New Testament, you think about somebody who would get absolutely everything totally completed in a matter of months in God without the process of, processes of God beating the living snot out of you. Think about how much arrogance would come. You got to understand pride is a beast. And if you don't know what it is sometimes to fall on your face and then the grace of God have to lift you back up off your face and you know you don't deserve to get off your face but yet he lifts you up anyway. Think about the amount of compassion that that will develop inside of you for others who are probably going to fall on their face somewhere during the course of the trip. You know what football taught me playing football? Not only to knock somebody's head off, but it taught me equally when I got knocked down, I could stand back up. 
And even if I experienced a broken bone, and I did, it would heal. And you'd start all over again. And see, during the course of this journey, as I moved through the tents of Ephraim, although we hail him today as this great patriarch of faith, You've got to be mindful of the times he probably dealt with managing doubt. You get a promise that you're going to have a son. In fact, what God said is, first thing, first promise, I'm going to establish a great nation out of you, and you don't even have a son. And then that son does not show up for 25 years years, at least the one that God will work with. Do you think you're not going to have some moments of doubt whether this thing is really going to come to pass? Do you think those of us who receive the message of the full possibility of life have not at times wondered if this, if it's going to happen in our generation? Sure, we deal with that, but we cast it down through bringing ourselves back to the word of the Lord and realizing that what God does is now. You see, this is why in, in the revelation, when you're talking about the full unfolding of his name as the ever-coming, ever-existing one, it says that he is, he was, and he is to come. Why do you think it always plays the present first? Because that is the reality God wants us to live in, is that whatever he said to us, it can have a present value and reality to it right now. And if we will embrace it, hallelujah, we, just, we won't have to talk about what God is going to do or what God used to do. You see, usually that's, that's the two languages that people talk in, the past or the future. How about the God right now? You see, when he gave him that promise, what God wanted that promise to do is come alive in his heart as though he had already possessed that promise. And he had to live with that, holding on to that until the idea became a manifestation in flesh. How do you really know that a new season is coming? There's really a, a, a simplicity to this. It's when the word becomes flesh. That's when you really know a new season has come. And my studies with Abraham uh, just has reminded me once again of all of these things. The three maxims that I saw in, in the narrative here. Number one was that Abraham had to leave everything he once knew. Everything. Everything he was comfortable with in order to receive and experience the next thing that God was doing in his life. Which at that time would have been the most current thing in the earth. Now, Let's come to something. When John said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. For some, that was cutting edge. They had been expecting Messiah. Probably the thought was drifting around, well, where is he that the Magi came to see, and we haven't seen him. And this was 30 years ago. Where is he at? And so when Jesus comes among those who were there at the Jordan, where John is baptizing, and then God, by opening his eyes, see, everybody else was looking, but everybody doesn't see because you're looking doesn't mean you see. And 
God opened his eyes so he could see, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the world. Now, that was a cutting-edge word for most. But as I look back on the story, the ones who really had the cutting edge or the beginning edge of this thing was Simeon and Anna. Because, you see, they saw what God was doing in the infancy stage. And what John was declaring was someone who had moved from a child born. Now he's looking at a son given. And in between, there's 30 years. And so sometimes, you know, people will be thinking, wow, this word of the kingdom, man, this is the cutting edge word that's come forth in this season. And you know what I want to say? You're just catching up to what God has been talking about for a long time. And there were those that, you know, in the 20th century that were right at the cutting edge of God beginning this conversation. And now what we're doing in the 21st century is continuing the conversation to make sure that it remains fresh. There are, different, there are different things that God will supplement from time to time because in our rituals, we become stale. So you have things like the Toronto Blessing. But here's the point, brethren. Whenever is a stream of anything, streams move rapid, they're shallow, they don't last. Yeah. They're there for a season. Enjoy it while it's happening. I don't condemn anybody for enjoying it while it's happening. <laughs> because it can be refreshing to you. But what God ultimately will do is swing you right back around through the refreshing. He says, now, this is what I really want to talk to you about. This is really what I'm doing. And all I've done is taken time out to refresh you, to get you back going. You know, when, when, then when I, when I was uh, observing uh, so many being slain in the spirit, and I, I, I never really did experience that too much. And I asked the Lord, I said, well, well I, I mean, are you a respected person? Like, you know, do, do they, get, they get this, and I, I can't have a, at least a little taste of this, you know? And, uh, and, and, and I'll never forget what he spoke to me. He says, have you considered maybe you've learned how to enter rest? And I said, oh, okay. Because they're laid out. You know, I'm watching this. And he said, have you considered maybe I'm laying them out so that they can begin to learn how to enter into my rest? Now, when I started as a young man, you'll catch up with that about tomorrow. When I started as a young man, man, I was as serious, as serious, as, I mean, deeply serious. I didn't even smile. You remember that, you remember that, uh, that, that commercial years ago where you had the old man with the pitchfork, the farm, and his wife, and they were singing, you country cornflakes? I mean, they're as serious as a heart attack would kill you. Well, I'm, I'm more serious than they were. I mean, Jill will tell you, when I came in from my office, when it was time to start service, my face was like Jesus. I was set like Flint. I was going to that podium. It's time to get this plane off the ground. People wanted to visit. They wanted to pat my shoulder and say, Pastor, I want to talk to you. I wasn't even concerned about them talking because I knew, number one, that they probably weren't prepared to even get themselves off the ground. And I had to get this plane off the ground, so I'm serious. You know, I'm marching down the aisle. Anne is right behind me. She's kissing babies. She's rubbing hair and rubbing shoulders and saying, Sweetheart, it's going to be all right. And I had to learn some things. They appreciate the fact that, you know, that I was a worship leader. I was willing to worship as their father, as their pastor. I was willing to worship. Get the plane off the ground, get us airborne, get us in the spirit where the spirit of God would begin to move. They appreciated that. But you know what? 
they actually knew together too. And a smile every once in a while didn't hurt. You know, the real serious face, the poker face. God delivered me from that. Because I realized that people needed to see the human face of the God-man. And so I started enjoying it. There are many different swings, intervals, weaving in and out that this trip requires. And I'm telling you now, learn to enjoy it. It's crucial. Learn to enjoy the trip. Because you don't want to get to the point where you're 70, 80, 90 years old. And all you can look back and think about, oh God, <laughs> that was a horrible journey. <laughs> Man, I'm glad we finally made it through. We used to sing a song many years ago, how I got over, how I got over, my soul looks back and wonder, <laughs> how I got over. I don't want to sing that song. In fact, I don't sing that song. I just thank God that we're over. And so he works in those little spaces of things, uh, experiences, and he doesn't want us to build or colonize at those experiences. What he wants us to do is enjoy them. So if there's a season of laughter, laugh. I mean, just hook right in. Brother, that's not me. It can become you. <laughs> see, I said the same. See, I'm only telling you what I said. That's not me. And the Lord said, you can either enjoy what I'm doing or you can sit on the sideline and observe, <laughs> criticize, yeah. say it's not necessary. Yeah. Come on, if God has released it, tell your neighbor it's necessary. But that's not my temperament. That's not my personality. Who said that you ever had to be locked in to one expression of personality? Quit believing everything psychology tells you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, Jesus was the perfect blend of all of them. And since the spirit of Christ is inside of us, so can we be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So whatever season God has downloaded, enjoy. But remember this, the pendulum is going to swing right back to his purpose. He said, I've refreshed you to get you back on track now. So the second maxim that I saw was that Father God had planned to magnify the existence of a seedless man by giving him seed that inherently carried a great nation inside of him. I could say to every one of you, the potential that is in the seed, the seed of Christ, that you are, is vastly beyond what you could imagine or think. In fact, if you think any less than that there's the possibility of a nation inside of me. You're thinking too small. Because there's one in every last one of you. And if you will allow God to develop you and to release you. You know, it's like, it's like uh, when he said to Israel when they were coming out, he said, now, you've been able to manage your little vegetable garden. He said, and you watered it by foot, by the foot pedal. Whenever you needed some water, 
He just pumped it up. Doesn't that sound like Pentecost to you? Whenever you need a little water, a little refreshing, just pump it up. Just get on the foot pedal and pump it up. So we get on things, come by here, good Lord, come by here. Somebody needs you, good God, come by here. <laughs> God said, I'm delivering you from that. He said, in the land that I'm bringing you into, said, you're not going to be able to water it by foot anymore. But what you're going to have to do is realize that the heavens is available to you, and now it comes from above and not from below. He says, the rains, I'm going to give you the rains. That's one of the things that's going to be a seal to this covenant that I'm cutting with you, is that I'm going to give you the rains. Hallelujah. Now, certainly we know that he gave circumcision as the seal within the body to indicate that they were covenant people. But equally, if you are an agrarian society, you're farming, you need rain. And God told them, I'm going to give you rain. You won't have to pump it up anymore. It's going to come from above. Now, what he was telling them, listen, church, what he was telling them is that your life source is going to come from above. And it's not from beneath anymore. That's why when you talk about the new birth, it really speaks to being born from above. Your life source is from above. Say it with me. My life source is from above. You see, all these lessons are interwoven in here. And as we will tap into the potential of what God has placed inside of us, out of every one of you can come a nation. Because the man whose seed you are, if we belong to Christ, then are we Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. That's what was inside of him, placed there by God. The third thing is that the covenantal nature of God would bless this, his obedient action, and Abraham would be blessed without a single curse being added. In fact, what God said to him is that whoever would treat you with contempt, I'll deal with them. Nobody can curse you because I've blessed you. I've discovered that there are five things specific to a blessing that a father conveys on a son. Maybe I can get to talk about that. But let's, let's deal, if I can get to nothing else, Let's deal with this one tent. I gave you the seven separations last night. Now let's, let's at least begin to explore the eight tents, T-E-N-T-S, the places where he camped. Now, you know that, that when Abraham is traveling, that there are no hotels, right? You know that. You know that there are no, lodge, there are no lodges to, to stay in, uh, nothing, no houses have been built. The only thing he has is a tent. Now, Arnaldo, who was a deacon and a son to me for years, he said, Pastor, let's go camping. And I said, you know, there's something inside of me that's not designed for that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't enjoy bugs. Uh, the brethren, whenever I go to South Africa and they take me on a safari, I said, uh, by the way, where am I going to stay? Because if we're going to stay out there all night, uh, I've read somewhere where Lions are nocturnal. <laughs> they see as well at night as we do during the day. And usually they hunt at night. And they would see me, an American, 200 plus pounds. <laughs> they say, what a steak. <laughs> I said, where are we going to stay? I said, someplace safe, I'm sure. They said, oh, yeah, they said, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the places that they have prepared said they're safe. I said, okay, fine. I said, uh, do I get a gun? Of course, you know, I can't get a gun because I figure, you know, one of them break in. They're not going to look at the peach steak that's uncooked. They're going to look at the steak that's cooked. <laughs> And deal, and deal with him first. I said, do I get a gun in this thing? <laughs> and 
so I, you know, so I, 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 I somewhat uh, in, enjoy tent life as long as it's during the day or if I'm preaching and I get to leave the tent. But can you imagine living 100 years traveling throughout the land and the only thing that you have to live in is a tent? And when it's time to move, you pull up your stakes, you, pull, you get your tent together, and then you go to your next camp, you got to start all over again. And you, you, know, you put your pegs down, you hook your ropes, and you get your tent up. Now think about Israel. They had 42 different encampments as they moved through those 40 years. And depending on when the cloud would move, they had to move. So let's say that you've just got everybody set up and the next day you see the cloud moving. See, come on, church. That, that, that was not the lazy people. Lazy people would be left behind. If, if, you, if, you didn't, if you didn't get your pegs up, get your tent, come on, rolled up and moving, you would be left behind. And it wouldn't be the left behind of the 20th century. <laughs> you would just simply be left behind. And so, you, and so you're living in a tent experience here. Now that's roughing it a bit. Because you see, you've got to think this thing through. You probably don't have a toilet. See, many of you young people don't know anything about an outhouse. I grew up with an outhouse. And that was when we had an upgrade. Before we had the upgrade of the outhouse, it was the woods. I mean, we lived in the sticks. Charmin? What in the world is that? No, the toilet paper was a Sears and Roebuck catalog. And, and you soften it up before you use it. You go into some of the developing countries, remote countries, and you're traveling from one stop to the next stop on the train. And I mean, the hygiene is really not the most excellent thing on the train. Train stops. You go find a spot. Take care of your business. Then he honks. You come and get back on the train. Still want to be a missionary? <laughs> Washing your hands? <laughs> I'm just trying to give you a perspective of what it was like then. Moving from place to place with your tent. No bathroom. No hot shower every day. I mean, man, I remember the foot tub. We wash twice a week. <laughs> and hopefully, you were the first one out of the 12 kids in the tub. Because they weren't going to be running water over and over and over and over because it's a new child. Now we get a fresh batch of water. Uh-uh. Such as life was, and probably even more remote than that, in the days of Abraham. And God calls him to go to a place that's higher. When my dad finally got a car, I said, my God, we've gone to hoghead heaven, boy. 
wow, this is amazing. Don't have the thumb anymore. Don't have to use Pat and Charlie as much. I mean, man, that, you're talking improvement. I mean, that was really improvement. When, 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 when people talk about being poor, we couldn't even add the O and the R on to it. We were poor. <laughs> I mean, we were so poor we couldn't even add O and R to the end of the word. And then we had neighbors who were even worse, so nobody really even knew that you were poor. Because the neighbors, they were so poor that whenever company would come over, they would send one of the 14 kids out in the yard to bark like a dog so everybody would think they were rich enough to have a dog. Well, anyway. And people say, hey, I can't wait till we go back to the good old days. And I want to say, oh, no, not, not Steve, no. You can go back if you want to. Return if you choose. Think about this. You see, all I'm doing is just trying to create a visual in your mind of what it was like when this man left everything because probably they were an aristocratic family back in Ur, the Chaldees. So at least they had the best of whatever the best was at that time. And God calls him, leave every bit of it. I'm going to take you on a journey, take you to a land, and you're going to rough it out for the next 100 years. I'm going to teach you some things. I'm going to teach you the dynamics of what it's like to follow my voice, hear it first, and then follow it. And this is not going to be the most comfortable, convenient trip you've ever been on. You see, my young brother and sister, one of the great things that you learn as a servant is that much of your serving may be in inconvenience. Whether it's always a crowd, always a demand on your time, it's always something to where you can't feed into yourself, but you're giving out of yourself, giving life to others. The book of Mark teaches us this because it's the book of Jesus, the perfect servant of the Lord. And inconvenience is there. Constantly people demanding. Constantly people around. You know, sometimes I sort of love my, my quiet space and uh, just get off and get secluded in my thoughts. And Ann used to come and knock on the door and say, Hello, my name is Ann. I'm your wife. Are you in there? <laughs> Because I'm all tucked away with God, you know, just locked into my meditation and my thoughts. And then I became a pastor. <laughs> and I thought they'd leave me alone so that I'd have something to preach. No. Oh, pastor, we need you. We need you now. Uh, uh, there was one particular person. Oh, uh, and she'd call about 2, 3 o'clock just about every day. Oh, and, and, and the call was like this. If you don't help me, I'm going to die tonight. <laughs> and at first, you know, you, you're compassionate. You, you know, you want to establish a pedigree of compassion. You want people at least to think that you really do care. Even if you're thinking deep inside, kill yourself. Get over it. Just get out of your misery. <laughs> Just leave me alone. Let me sleep. You're, you're waking me even when God, I know God neither slumbers nor does he sleep, but you're waking me even when God's asleep. So get, get over it. Get over it. So I, the first few times I, I would uh, respond to that, and then finally I said, wait a minute, I got to deal with this. Because if I don't, as Barney Fife would say, nip this thing in the bud right now, I'm going to be dealing with this for the next few years. 
So finally one night she called. I said, okay, you're going to kill yourself, right? I said, leave your will on the table. Tell us exactly what you want us to do at your funeral. I'll preach you a nice funeral. She didn't call me the next night. <laughs> I told the elders, I said, if she calls you, this is what you tell her. I said, because deliverance is not necessarily gagging in a bag. Deliverance can come with a better information system working inside of you. If you realize they're not going to put up with your mess. If you're threatening to kill yourself and they tell you, go ahead. <laughs> we'll bury you nicely. I mean, we'll treat you with respect, with grace. Hallelujah. We'll have a repast after we do your funeral, after we bury you. We'll eat chicken. We'll have collard greens. We'll have potato salad. We'll even have some potato pie. We'll drink plenty of lemonade or in the South, plenty of sweet tea. We'll make sure that we celebrate you right. And when I finally announced that over the pulpit, you know people stopped calling me. With those outrageous calls, I'm going to kill myself, Pastor, if you don't, right now. And I'm thinking, why are they still alive? Because they were alive before I ever came along. And I'm sure they had the same problems before I ever came along. <laughs> oh, man, the things that you learn as a leader. Some things you learn real fast. Counseling, I drive that up real fast. I let Jill and some of the other mothers do all that stuff. But as far as I was concerned, counseling was not for me. I mean, think about it. Pastor, I need to talk to you right at the service today because, oh, I just got to talk to you now. And, 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 and it won't take long at the service. And, 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 you know, and I just need to talk to you because I need a little bit of a, uh, need an answer here. And, and more than likely, the answer that I'm going to give is right in the message that I'm going to convey that day because the Spirit of the Lord will locate you exactly where you are, feed you exactly what you need to feed. And if you're listening, you'll hear what you need. But yet after it's over, oh, Pastor, I still need to talk to you. Now, here's what's going on. We've led worship for an hour, preach for another hour and a half, sometimes minister prophetically, prayed for people. That would take another half hour to an hour. Don't you think I was tired at the end of that? I mean, man, that almost get me to hooping. Don't you think I was tired after that? I didn't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> and he would come, Pastor, I still need to talk to you. <laughs> and then I'm having to put on a smiley face. And everything in me was like that duck, you know, you see the duck sailing across the water. He looks the, the picture of tranquility, but underneath his feet paddling away. Well, inside of me, my face was the face of tranquility. I learned a poker face fast, but inside, man, I was paddling away. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> now, see, Dale's not that way, but. And so we get in the office. I didn't want to be there. I'm telling you that straight up. And I said, you got 10 minutes to tell me the story. Because after that, all you're going to be doing is repeating yourself. I said, so tell me the story in 10 minutes. They tell me the story, in our, in our, and here's wisdom for all of you young men who will ever pastor. Take your wife in there with you. Because she's going to sense and discern some things that you won't even pick up, especially if it's a woman and they're talking to you. <laughs> because her intuition, brother, believe me, is a whole lot sharper than yours. And 
And there would be things that Ann would pick up. I'd say, come on, honey, we got to go in here. And I'm tired after these, you know, three hours. And I'm ready, to, honestly, to get a nap. And so about eight minutes in this story, I'm dozing off. And, 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 you know, and, every, and every pastor's wife has a good elbow ministry. But, I mean, you know, Ann would hit me with that elbow. I snapped out of it. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm, I'm listening. Yes, yes, yes. I'm attentive. Yes. And I'd give him two more minutes. And I'd say, okay, are you done? No, 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 I'm not. I said, yes, you're done. <laughs> I said, because you see, the pinstripe priests are waiting on me. <laughs> you didn't catch it. The football officials, the pinstripe priests are waiting on me. And so I hit the recliner and... They watch me more than I watch them because we go to a place called Eyelidology. <laughs> so thus, I didn't have many counseling appointments. Because there's no need to talk to him Said so, so he, he's, he's not going to tell you anything. You go in there, you expect an answer. No, 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 no. This is what it came down to. They really wanted me to co-sign the note. And the Lord already told you in the Proverbs, don't be co-signing. So I would say, okay, tell me what you want to do. Well, this is what I want to do. I want to leave my husband. Uh, he's terrible. I said, do you think the next one that you're going to find is not going to be terrible? I say because terrible is only the definition that comes out of you. <laughs> I said somebody else may think he's absolutely wonderful. I said, so what is it really? And finally they just get down to the bottom. I just think I just want to leave. I said, okay, I'm going to tell you what Jesus told Judas. Do it. Do it quickly. You told me you were going to leave. All I'm doing is just eliminating you of your misery. And I know you want me to talk you out of it. I said, listen, sweetheart. I said, as President Bush once said, read my lips. I'm not going to try to talk you out of nothing you've made your mind up to do. That's like trying to talk people. They say, they come in, Pastor, we're going to leave the church. Well, okay. And I don't tell them what George Jefferson said, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord spits you. No, I don't even tell them that. I don't even think that. I just wave and say, okay. Because you've got to understand something, folks. If the Holy Ghost can't keep them, you can't keep them. And I mean, that's just, I had to learn that the hard way. At first, I would try to talk to everybody. Oh, you need to stay here. You know God, you told me God sent you here. You said this is the greatest thing since apple pie and vanilla ice cream that God let, oh, you yeah, know I mean, folks, oh, this is so wonderful. My God, I never heard such truth before in all of my life. You're the greatest. Uh, You have not committed a misdemeanor yet, much less a felony, in their minds. See, here's a misdemeanor. Maybe you passed by and you didn't speak. Now, you know, maybe your face was all contorted because you had gas. And they, and, they, and they see that as rejection, you know, and, uh, and oh, God, did you see the way that he looked at me? You're not looking at them. All you're thinking about is relief. <laughs> That's a misdemeanor. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Now, here's the felony. When you start messing around with the women and stealing the money. That's a felony. And as long as you haven't committed any misdemeanors or felonies as a pastor, you're wonderful. And most men of God that Dale and I are aware of are not men who are going to be giving themselves to felony. I, tell, I say it this way. Stay away from the girls. Stay away from the gold. And stay away from the glory. And you're safe. But especially that first one. <laughs> you see, church, the reason that we've got to reestablish right doctrine See, I travel, and I go a lot of places, and I'm being asked questions like, Everett, do you think God only intended for a man to have just his wife and not other women? Yeah, Irene, yeah, yeah. Questions like that are being asked, and I'm talking about by people who are leading thousands of people today. That's why there's a need for right doctrine. And then here's the excuse that's given. Well, you know, Abraham had Sarah, and he also had Hagar. And there were others. Well, you know, David, now, you know, Abraham, you know, he's the father of our faith. Now, David, come on, a man after God's own heart. Do you remember how many wives he had? Don't even mention Solomon. I mean, Will Chamberlain didn't even have nothing on him. <laughs> Hundreds of wives and thousands of concubines. And I said, if I could just have a conversation with Solomon, I would ask him, what was your secret? <laughs> Tell me what your secret was, because... And they use examples like that and pull from the Old Testament and say that, well, if that happened with them and they were acceptable to God, don't you think it's acceptable today? And I said, okay, let's upgrade this conversation. What did Jesus say? Because you had two schools of thought, the school of Hillel, the school of Shammai, and, and, when, and, and they were opposing schools, conflicting schools, a liberal school, a conservative school. And they said, what do you say about marriage? This is what Jesus said. Moses gave you the right to have bills of divorcement because of the hardness of your heart. In other words, your hearts weren't right. He said, but it was not so from the beginning. You see, when you're talking about right doctrine, you got to take it back to the original conversation that God had with man. What was on the original agenda? He said it was not so from the beginning. But from the beginning, it was one man and one woman. And that's enough. This is what I say. If we follow Peter's instructions, he said, Husbands, you're to dwell with your wives according to, your knowledge, according to knowledge so that you do not hinder your own prayers. That word there, knowledge, means study her. <laughs> How many women does a man need to study at one time? I say one is enough. How about you other brothers? Would you not say one is enough? Is tough enough studying one, trying to figure out one? <laughs> you wouldn't believe things like that are floating out there. But it is. And that's why you need true apostles and fathers to reset the paradigm. So that brings me in this, the tent number one. It took me a long time to get there, but I'm going to finish. I'm going to just give you tent number one. Because when you talk about tent number one, that's the place where 
the pattern gets established in your heart for the rest of the course. It's there. I talked about him living in tents, roughing it, the whole thing. It's not easy. It's not convenient. But this is what the scriptures say. By an act of faith, Hebrews 11, verse 8 through 10, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. And when he left, he had no idea where he was going. God said to us many years ago, if you knew exactly where I was taking you, you would not take the trip. So I'm only going to give you information on a need-to-know basis. So by an act of faith, he lived in the country promised him, lived as a stranger camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. We know that uh, when you look at from Genesis 12 up to Genesis 21, we're only looking at 25 years. From Genesis 21 to Genesis 25, we're looking at the remaining 75 years of his life. Now, those 25 years, we have the birth of Isaac. Isaac was 60 years old when Jacob was born. So, Isaac lived with his father for 75 years. Jacob lived with his grandfather for 15 years. So you have this cross-pollination of Abraham even into Jacob's life. So they lived with him in tents. Living under the same promise, Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real and eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. That's what he was looking for. You see, when, when you look at uh, really... The, the major points of this. Let me read a couple other passages. In Acts chapter 7, verse 4 to 5, and Stephen is preaching here, New Living Translation. He said, So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. He's talking to them. He said, But God gave him no inheritance here. Think about this. Not even one square foot of land. God did promise, however, that eventually the whole land would belong to Abraham and his descendants, even though he had no children yet. And then in Hebrews, of course, 11, and then verse 8 to 10, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another. Another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land, God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking for a city with eternal foundations, a city again designed and built by God. Now, a couple points here. Number one is for the next 100 years, he's on a trip. 100 years is not a long term. When you think about what you're looking for, it's eternal. It's a very short period of time. And he lived most of that time, those 100 years, in the land except for a short period in Egypt. You know that he sojourned there. When you're without a country, and that is a point of identification, as I said last night, your country speaks of your nationality. It speaks of your citizenship. So here we have a man that's without citizenship. The definition of nationality is this. It's the status of belonging to a particular nation by origin, birth, or naturalization. A people having common traditions or origins and often constituting a nation. Existence as a politically autonomous entity. So when you leave, in the broadest sense, you leave your citizenship. As all of us who traveled abroad understand, when they ask you for your documents, one of the main things they're looking for is your citizenship. Where were you born? Because that is what they're looking for. So Abraham is temporarily becomes a man without a country, without citizenship. What God had done was distance him from his previous citizenship and sending him far away. Now the work of God was so powerful in his heart that he sought himself no opportunity to return to his original country. 
That's what he did. That's the decision he made. Now he would have to find that place in God for his true citizenship, which was higher than what he left. Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16 says, All these people died still believing that God had, what God had promised them. And if you go back and look at the list leading up to this verse here in verse 13, look at the list. It says all of them died. You know who's interestingly in that list? Enoch. Wait a minute, brother. I thought Enoch didn't die. No, you got to understand. He just didn't die the kind of death that every other man had died. But physically, he left this earth. He transitioned. They all die. Think about that. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country that they can call their own. If they longed for the country that they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God, now I want you to consider here, didn't say they were looking for heaven. Heavenly here is only an adjective that's descriptive of what they were looking for. It's like we've been raised up into heavenly places, but our feet are still here on earth. Are you with me? We have a heavenly calling, but we're still postured here on earth. It just tells us that the nature of heaven is inside of our calling. It's the nature of heaven that's inside of the country that we're looking for. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And as Pastor Dale said earlier this morning, what we know from Revelation 21 and 22, the city is not something you go to. The city is something that's coming out of the invisible, the unseen, to the seen dimension called the earth. Now that's the first thing that you've got to consider. When God drew you out, what you're looking for, what you're really searching for, is something that has a heavenly texture and context. And you'll never be satisfied by returning back to that which is earthly. Whether you're talking about returning back to a geography that maybe God drew you out of. I mean, people ask me all the time, are you coming back to North Carolina now? And it's almost like every time, you know, I, I, I say, well, maybe I'll consider it. I'll go back to North Carolina. I mean, my family's still there. My oldest brother's not there. And, you know, a few other family members. And I'll go back, and there's something there that says, no, I don't think so. I mean, what am I going back to? If I go back to the church that I came out of, they'll be so intimidated that... Many things God It will not bring increase in your life anymore, and more than likely you're going to stunt your growth. See, Cora, Dathan, Abraham, and their company, you know what they were always talking about? Let's go back to Egypt. Why? I mean, you couldn't wait to get out of there. Why do you want to go back there? I mean, you didn't stay there when everybody else was leaving. You didn't say, oh, I think I'll just stay back here. Why go back? You see, because what you're in many times is so unpredictable. You can't read a book. You can't find a book. You can't find anything that says this is step one, two, and three of how to manage this experience that you come into. You've got to trust and lean on God. As Proverbs says, you've got to trust God with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. And what will he do? He will direct It's what I call jumping out of the plane without a parachute and knowing that God will land you softly on your feet. 
If I went back to Carolina, it would be predictable. And what would be most predictable is how miserable I was. So even if I'm to move to a different geography, spiritually it cannot be returning to what I left. And it's by faith you keep walking. You see, God has begun a different conversation with me. I don't know fully where all this is leading to. All I know is he has begun a conversation. You see, for me, it's clear from the narrative here in Hebrews 11, 8 to 10 that in sojourning, you're only temporarily dwelling. It's not staying in any one spot forever. It's not an eternal condition. So God may demand of you. Now, I hope you're hearing this in the spirit. Because you see, wherever you are experientially right now, the time will come and you'll hear the voice of God say, all right, upgrade. As Isaiah chapter 2 says, Micah 4 says, you will hear that voice from God is calling you up. You'll hear it. But what God was doing was solidifying something of himself in each place that he encamped. And the way to discover this is to observe the places they live in the land and consider the definitions of their name. And the first one was Shechem. Now, by definition, this is what Shechem means. It means the ridge. So we're not talking about plain, flat land. We're not talking about comfort here. If you live in the mountains, come on, you've got to have a different kind of mindset than you do the flat land. But it also goes back to the word that means the neck between the shoulders as the place of burdens. This was the first place he camped in Kenya. So I call this his first fruit experience in the land. It's the first thing. The Lord appeared to Ephraim again and confirmed his promises. And it was here in Shechem that Ephraim erected the first altar unto the Lord. And it was at a place called Mora, which simply means it's the place of the archer, the teacher or teaching, the place where you experience the early rain or the teaching rain. Now, what I love about this is that I said, Lord, what really do I focus on? And what really do you want me to transmit if I was talking to a millennial? generation and this is the focus he said talk to them about the burden because Shechem is the place of the burdens talk to them about the burden that someone who has really been drafted into the kingdom tell them about the burden that you carry Tell them about the thing that burns passionately in your heart every day. The thing that you not only can't live without, but it's the thing that you'll die for if it's necessary. Because that's your burden. The prophets, many times, they carried this thing and it would come forth. It would be like the burden of Amos. And burden in that sense was a, not only a prophetic decree that was being released, but oftentimes it would come forth as a song because many times you will literally disengage people's resistance when you sing to them. I said, what can I say about this that is burned inside of my bosom? Since 1975. Has it been like a fire that blazed up sometimes and die out? 
but it's been a fire, as Jeremiah said, that's burned inside of my bones as deep as you can go. And regardless to what my circumstances might be, conflicts may be, whatever it may be, whenever I come out of it, that is what still burns inside of me. If you're talking about that which motivates me, that which encourages me to get up, that's what it is. And it's the kingdom. The kingdom. The kingdom. I can't get over it. Yes, I started as a Pentecostal. Yes, God put some things in my life through that experience. And I'm still Pentecostal today. As Paul said, I still talk in tongues just as much today as I did back then. But he's added to my understanding in the process because when you receive the Holy Ghost, the kingdom is in the Holy Ghost. It is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So if you have the Holy Ghost, you can, ex you can, you can expect this, that God will lead you to the place where you will wrap your arms around the kingdom. And it'll burn inside of you day and night. You see, what he had to get was a burden for what he had just entered into. And this is the place, Shechem, where God chose to do this. Because when you look the word burden up, is the place where you gaze at it, you perceive it, you contemplate it with pleasure. It becomes the vision inside of you. And that's what God had to put in you. A vision for this land that he had just come into. And it more specifically happened when he was separated from Lot. When God said, now lift up your eyes. Look around about you. You've been here all the time, but this veil of the flesh called Lot, he prevented you from seeing everything that I wanted you to see. But now, but now, he's gone. See, some things, when they go, we don't need to cry. We need to thank God they're gone. And if you're here, the voice of your father speak to you. In that instance, he'll tell you, lift your head up and see what I'm doing. Yeah, lift your head up. Come on, you've gone through some things in the last two years. And this is what I want to tell you. Stop looking back. Stop looking back. Stop it now. Lift your head up and look round about you and see what God is doing. And you'll stop crying. And what you will do is you will erect an altar just like Abraham did because he was connected there to the oak of Morah and that was a teaching experience. What God was saying to him is, I brought you to this place not only to introduce you to a burden, but to teach you. And how I'm going to begin to do it is I'm going to come to you as the early rain. Because the early rain is a teaching rain. The Holy Ghost, come on, in its earliest phases is a teaching rain. That's why he will teach you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this altar gave God fresh accessibility to Abraham's life. And it gave Abraham the opportunity to see a new from a new perspective what he had entered into. You see, Pastor Dale, you know, our job many times really is this. Get them to see. Because if we'll get them to see, it'll start burning inside of them. And if it starts burning inside of you, you're going to have to do a whole lot to put the fire out. Because here's Jeremiah. He's dropped down in the dungeon. I mean, do you realize what he was in? We call it mire. You know what it was? It was waste. 
can I say it this way without being gross? He was in the dookie pot. Now, do you think not getting in there? Well, maybe say, maybe I ought to reconsider my options. But you see, when, you call, when you're called of God like Jeremiah was, remember what God said? He touched his tongue. Remember that? He said, before you were even born, I've made you a prophet to the nations. So God had already purposed him, positioned him, before he even realized what was even going on. And so now he says he's come, come on, to touch his tongue. And I'm telling you, once those coals of fire touch your tongue, once they ignite you, once they light you up, sweetie, you cannot get away from it, not ever again. You may make your bed in hell, you'll find him there. Come on, if you try to fly away, you'll find him there. You're going you're gonna to find out that because he has staked his claim in sight of you, he's not going to let you go. Now, this is what I want to say to you. In, he, in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, remember something Jesus said? He said, come unto me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. And I can say amen to that. It doesn't have to be heavy. Because what God does in the kingdom is he inoculates you with joy. And the joy of the Lord will always be your strength if you're permitted to be. So whenever we discern the prophetic burden, whatever we discern it to be, it cannot become something so difficult to bear emotionally and physically because if we permit it to do that, it will eventually overwhelm our spiritual status. The third thing about this burden, because you see, this is why you've got to stop there, tent number one, is that the prophetic burden should be received as a love assignment and never a duty. It is the privilege of carrying the life of Christ to our generation, just as when you describe a ship full of its cargo, that's called its burden. Just as a ship is distinguished by the weight of the cargo carried by the vessel at one time, which is its burden. The fourth thing about the prophetic burden, if you've heard nothing else I've said, hear this. Let your burden become a song. Allow it to articulate a clear utterance from the Father rather than a dirge or a lament of someone carrying something too burdensome. You see, the way that it be doesn't become that is tap into grace. You see, Father never intended for us to use grace as an excuse to do whatever we would want to do anyway. Grace is divine strength. And if I will allow grace to teach me and to minister to me, you see, what he gives, although it's light, his burden is light. It's still a burden. You see, I still carry this thing in my heart to make sure that the next generation receives and extends what God gave my generation. That's my burden today. It's my burden that young men and women learn the scriptures. They learn the doctrines of Christ. They learn what's true. They don't just rely upon mercy at all times. 
but they understand that mercy and truth have come together as a balance. Grace and peace is there as a balance. You have peace when you manage and stewardship grace properly. I carry a burden for the apostles doctrine. I carry a burden for the kingdom. But it's not something that overwhelms me. It has not become a dirge inside of me. It hasn't become so overwhelming that I'm lamenting over this thing. No, I'm still in joy about it. And this is what keeps me in joy. As I keep my altar erected. Men should always pray. They ain't not. My tent isn't just there. But my altar's there too. Hallelujah. And I choose to let the teacher keep teaching me. Yeah, 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 we've learned many things, but the teacher is still instructing me. So tell your neighbor, school is not out. Would you stand with me? I'll come back another time and talk about the other seven tents. <laughs> you let me know when the time is right. For your friends, you make, you make yourself available. Yeah, amen. I want to, uh, this morning, seal this. The way I want to do this this morning, I ask you this question. Is the burden of the kingdom still burning with fire inside you as it was from the moment that he first revealed it to you? And then maybe the second aspect of this question, the song. Has that burden ever seared you to the point that no one could ever draw you away from what he's called you into? If either one of the answers to those questions was maybe, not quite sure. I'm going to ask you to do something today. You see what I'm doing? I'm lifting my hands. You know what I'm saying to my father? Torch me all over again. Torch me with the burden for the land that you brought me into, which is the kingdom, all over again. This is a new year. It's the year 2017. It's a year that we've never lived in before, a year that you want to do things you've never done before, in me, through me, to others. Torch me with your burden. Let this reality call Shechem blaze afresh inside of me today. Ina mandala bashata, shatori andala busanda rabanda na basata, shatele mangane ni andala randele busanda la bakita randala basata. Ina na na mo sheke mindi de bokuri anda bandi de beke sili di anda. Randala bokusuri andala bokusha mandala randala bashata. 
It was at the same place, Shechem, where Joshua made his final speech. Where he declared, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what we will do. That's our conclusion of the matter. Hallelujah. And that's what I, 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 I really sense of God today that, that from, from our spirit man flowing forth as echoing into this atmosphere that has been created, that we declare, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll serve his purpose. We'll do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We won't just let it become embers that's barely alive. But ask God for this year. Ask him. Ask him. Put a blaze inside of it. That will burn through anything. No matter what your situation may be, that blaze will keep you so focused on him that you'll continue to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the deal. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. statement says, what can you say to these things? These things are eternal. Um, the man of God today just opened up the whole dimension of my life and my heart. Begin. Maybe you can go about and see Christianity one way or another by looking around at other things, but God said not to compare ourselves against ourselves. We made the statement here multiple times over these past 30 years. The insight into the kingdom is not taught, it's caught. And if the Holy Ghost ever burns the real understanding of the kingdom of God in your life, you'll find that everything else, it may have purpose, but it doesn't have that purpose. Because the original intent and the purpose was not redemptive in the fact that they had to correct what God had determined and put mankind here to express and control planet Earth according to his word. And if God ever burns that into your innermost, you cannot look at the church or Christianity through any other colored glass. You have to see it through the vision of the kingdom. I didn't I didn't ask for that. I was happy being a little Nazarene boy. But God in his divine plan, through the operation of his working, and then he's gathered you. All of you have been gathered out of something. You could have been gathered to anything else, but why has God gathered you to hear a word of the kingdom? And we 
we've got to take that more seriously than just life, just existence or satisfaction. But we've got to understand that God has a plan. Amen? And if we walk out his plan with joy, that's our choice, he'll supply more joy. Amen? I'm so thankful for this time with Steve. I, I realize everything he wanted to cover, he didn't cover, but that's how the Holy Ghost does sometimes. And so maybe we can plug him back in here in two, three months, and uh, he can take it from there, you know. So, but uh, we, we'll, we'll get that all worked out in the next day or two, so. We have to get our calendars all together because we got mission work doing and we got this and that for the next few months. But that's all right. We can work it all out. Amen? Are you glad you're here? Okay, I have one request of every one of us, okay? I'm, I learned a long time ago from gathering with Brother Kelly that he said the anointing on all of us is greater than the anointing on any one of us. And so there's anointing in the house today. Um, it isn't a feeling, it's an anointing. And one of the things that Brother Steve needs in these next days ahead is anointing. Because I believe that the enemy would do everything he could do to upset the plan. I know Brother Steve has no desire to vary from the plan or go from the plan, but when you're walking on a path you've never walked before and you're going in a direction that you've never been before, you need strength, you need encouragement. And so before we leave today, I want all of us to gather and pray and commit to the Lord that we will keep him in our prayers and pray God's anointing and direction on his life for the next, I, I sense at least through this year, okay? This year is, is a, the crucial time. This is the crucial time, and so we're going to pray for him. Um, I want to do that. Another thing I want each one of you to re remind me, remind me, I'm going to need to be reminded, but I'm going to give you a little information. For those of you who have access to um, Facebook or, or that aspect, I want you to do a search and find Behold the Man Ministries. Okay? Can you remember that? Some of you, some of you look on at me like a mule looking at a new gate, you know. So, behold the man ministries. The guy's name is Jeremiah Johnson. But then I want you to look for his January 31st post on the third wave. It's exactly what Brother Steve's been talking about on sound doctrine. I, I just tell you that. And then you remind me, and I'm, on Thursday evening, I will take a couple of moments and read that uh, portion to each and every one of us. I believe the man of God has caught what God is after. And this morning I woke up, and when I got out of the shower, the Lord said to me, the eternal purpose. And it is only the eternal purpose for planet Earth, but it's the eternal purpose for the church. God wants us to return to the eternal purpose, the eternal plan, what God has planned for us. And we face in life all kind of these disruptions and distractions that will pull us away from those things. And God wants us to take a serious look at our thought life and refocus on the eternal purpose, okay? Is that all right? Amen? Praise God. Let's gather. We're going to pray for Brother Steve.